Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the RSIS book launch webinar titled The Invention of China. It is a book launch featuring uh, Dr. Bill Hayton of the Chatham House and his book, uh, The Invention of China. Now, let me just remind the audience of a few housekeeping rules before I proceed with the rest of the introduction. Um, first of all, if you feel you want to raise a question, uh, you can uh, actually post it up before uh, any of the speakers uh, end their respective speech segments. All right, you can actually put it up on the Q&A function found at the bottom, uh, the middle of the bottom of your screen, all right, on Zoom. Um, and I, given the, the, the compressed nature of the webinar, I won't be able to answer, uh, to raise uh, on your behalf all the questions that you would like uh, Dr. Hayton to respond to. I will have to exercise my judicious uh, judgment uh, as a chair of the session to pick and choose uh, which questions which I can direct to him. Of course, I'll try to do justice to every single question uh, that comes through, all right? Uh, now, this book uh, that we are launching with a, a webinar today, uh, The Invention of China, uh, is described as a provocative account uh, arguing that China, between better commas, uh, and its 5,000 years of unified history is a national myth created only a century ago with a political agenda that uh, has an enduring quality up to the present, all right? Uh, again, I will not uh, go in depth into what the book was all about. Um, I'll leave it to Dr. Hayton to unveil right, the, the gist of the book uh, in a short while. Uh, but uh, needless to say, given a title like this, um, it is very timely uh, in the sense that uh, it tries to paint you a very incisive background as to why uh, President Xi Jinping um, seems to be pursuing a relatively muscular uh, Chinese foreign policy at this moment, uh, willing to risk uh, a number of rows, not just with uh, China's immediate neighbors, but also with uh, slightly more distant, but uh, peer competitors like the United States, uh, occasionally with Russia, uh, and definitely with uh, the European Union uh, and, and so forth, all right? Um, now, uh, the other, big burning questions that form the context of uh, Dr. Hayton's book uh, is this idea of China as a peacefully rising great power. Uh, his book addresses this uh, head on uh, through historical readings. And uh, from what I've seen of the preview of his slides, uh, you know, he will give you a very deep picture about uh, the intellectual roots of this great power. Uh, President Xi's ambitions and domestic supremacy is something that is also treated perhaps not completely in a very direct manner, uh, because this is a book with a, a huge historical suite. Uh, but nonetheless, there will be significant bearing on uh, whatever you want to take away or interpret of President Xi Jinping's ambitions and domestic supremacy and how uh, the importance of manipulating the representation of China is crucial as a rampart of President Xi's uh, ambitions and legitimacy and so on. Uh, and finally, what I found uh, very intriguing about the book uh, is this facet called Chinese nationalism. Now, Chinese nationalism is something that actually predates uh, President Xi Jinping's government. Uh, you can talk about it as far back as 1911, 1912, maybe even earlier. Uh, Again, you know, it depends, it depends on how far you want to buy into Dr. Hayton's account of the invention of China as uh, a 21st century nation. Uh, and you have to think through his provocations across all the chapters as to when this label China, the, the current nation state that we know it as, uh, started becoming itself, all right? So that's uh, the degree of provocation that this uh, interesting book uh, promises. And uh, before I hand the floor over to Dr. Bill Hayton, just something about his background. Uh, he is currently an associate fellow with the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House, a leading think tank in the UK. Uh, and he's also a journalist with the BBC News in London and a regular writer on Asian uh, political issues. 
He's also, also the author of uh, The South China Sea, The Struggle for Power in Asia, also published by Yale University Press, and Vietnam Rising Dragon, also published by Yale University Press. He had spent a few stints as a BBC reporter in Vietnam uh, in 2013, 2014, and then he was also seconded to uh, the Myanmar State Broadcaster to work on media reform. So he comes with uh, a wealth of experience reporting, scrutinizing Asia, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, Dr. Bill Hayton, if you're ready, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you to RSIS for organizing this and to Alan and uh, Shreya for taking part. It's great. Uh, as you say, I, I come to this as an outsider. Uh, I got into the subject because of my research on the South China Sea. Um, and that led me to thinking about other questions to do with uh, territorial claims and then into questions of identity and uh, all the other issues that I try and tackle in the book. So what do I mean by the invention of China? Um, my argument here is really that, um, I'm just going to switch to some slides now, um, is that the modern idea of China, the version of itself that China presents to the world, was constructed or invented in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I want to argue that that vision was and still is a hybrid. It's not authentically Chinese, whatever that might mean and that it, this vision was primarily constructed outside the country by people who were in exile or who were sojourners or foreigners in, in different capacities. To abbreviate the story considerably, Europeans had over many centuries developed strong ideas about a place in the East called China or perhaps Cathay. These were ideas based upon scattered reports from missionaries, traders, diplomats and other travelers that had been embellished and filtered through European worldviews and taken on a life of their own. You might call it Orientalism. These ideas were then taken to Asia by a new generation of missionaries, traders, diplomats, and other travelers, where they received a different welcome from the people who were there. So the people involved in this process, um, some of the pictures here, um, uh, were the ones who transferred these ideas, adopted them, and adapted them. In the late 19th century, therefore, as the Qing Empire endured successive economic crises, external attacks and internal conflicts, reform-minded intellectuals within the empire adopted and adapted these new ideas to both explain the situation they were in and guide them to a path for salvation. And this process was turbocharged after the, after the crushing of the reform movement in 1898 and the exiling of its leading thinkers to Japan. From then onwards, the intellectual development of Chinese nationalism was driven by people outside the country, whether in Japan, Southeast Asia, or North America. This process became even more pronounced during the 1900s as reformists competed with revolutionaries for the support of overseas Chinese Hua Chao communities around the world. And from these overseas outposts, new ideas filtered into the country during the 1900s until the revolution of 1911-12 allowed them to become dominant. So the easiest way to demonstrate what I mean is to look at a few words, some of the words I discuss in the book. These are words that were deliberately invented during this period in order to translate foreign concepts into the Chinese language. My argument is that they also enabled new ways of thinking about Chineseness itself. These words helped invent modern China, and I'll talk about some of them in the presentation. Now at the outset, I think I need to and acknowledge that uh, a lot of this work is based on uh, pre-existing academic work. What I've tried to do is create a narrative which will allow these insights uh, to reach a general uh, population. Uh, and these are some of the people whose work uh, I've uh, relied on in my writing. Um, I wanna make a slightly bigger assertion that I think that when we stand back and see the bigger picture of all of these uh, linguistic inventions, we start to see that the idea of China as a defined portion of the Earth's surface, one that's inhabited by a single nation with a dominant culture extending across all its territory and a single language. In other words, all the elements of an idealized 19th century European nation state is in itself an outsider's invention. As a result, I'm going to limit my use of the name China to the period after the 1911-12 revolution. For the two and a half centuries before then, I'll try to use the term the Qing great state Da Qingguo, borrowing Timothy Brooks' idea of the great state 
as an inner Asian form of rule created by the Mongols and then adapted and adopted by the subsequent Ming and Qing great states. Now the book starts in the understanding that the Qing great state was a Manchu state that had its origins in the Jurchen people northeast of the Great Wall, a state which declared itself to be the Qing in 1636, conquered the Ming in 1644 and ruled a multi-ethnic domain until 1912. That would mean that China proper, the 15 provinces of the former Ming, were therefore a colony of an inner Asian empire. And to give you an example, if you go to the Palace of Earthly Tranquility in the Forbidden City, you may learn that it was the Emperor's honeymoon suite. But if you read Jeremy Barmay's book on the Forbidden City, you will know that it was used as a place of ritual sacrifice in the Manchu tradition every morning. The court worked hard to maintain a Manchu identity right to the end. Manchu was a court language right up until 1912, and the leadership insisted that traditional archery be practiced and other sources of identity be maintained. Manchus were limited to certain roles. Uh, cities were um, physically divided right up until the 1900s. Intermarriage was banned until 1902. Um, so what was the nature of the state, therefore, that foreigners encountered when they arrived in the wake of the two opium wars in the mid 19th century. They found a Mongol way of ruling adapted by Manchu rulers, uh, what Pamela Crossley has called simultaneous rule, different techniques for different regions. It was a framework in which five constituencies, Manchu, Han, Mongol, Muslim, and Tibetans, each defined by different writing scripts and corresponding to a particular territory could coexist within a great state while maintaining their own beliefs and systems of rule. So it was the Qing who introduced the idea of Han for the inhabitants of the conquered 15 provinces. It was their way of dividing the population between the rulers, the man and the ruled, the Han. And the process of Chinese nation building is really a, sto a story of how this state was turned inside out. The ruled became the rulers, but in the process they had to reimagine the history of the state and its peoples and how they related to one another. Chinese nationalists assumed the right to rule the entirety of what, at least in territory, was a largely non-Chinese empire. They also assumed the right to decide who was Chinese, how their Chineseness should be expressed, what language they should speak, and so on. And they did this in many ways, and my book looks at several aspects. However, for the purposes of time, I'm going to focus on ideas of race, uh, niche, uh, history, and nation. So I start from the position that there's no such thing as race. There are no clear biological divisions between groups of human beings that allow us to divide white from yellow or Han from Korean. However, these ideas did exert a strong influence over politics in both Europe and Asia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So take one key figure, Huang Zunxian, a Hakka man from Guangdong. He arrived in Tokyo in 1877 as part of the first Qing diplomatic delegation there. He became a keen observer and sometimes critic of the freedom and people's rights movement in Japan, often reading and commenting on the European tracts that the movement translated and published. They included the work of Herbert Spencer. At the time, Spencer, a British biologist, was one of the, was one of the most famous people in the world, and he thought in racial terms. He was a social Darwinist. He saw politics as a struggle between racial groups. After reading Spencer, Huang also became a social Darwinist. In his poetry, he coined the word jong, or breed, as an equivalent to Spencer's use of the English word race. Huang's next stop on his diplomatic career would radically change his thoughts on race. He came to believe that competition, not cooperation, was the natural international order and that only the fittest would survive. In 1882, he became the consul in San Francisco during a time of race riots and discrimination against Chinese. In 1885, he resigned in despair and returned to Beijing. There he met many of the reform-minded intelligentsia and passed on the ideas of social Darwinism to them. In 1896, he founded a reformist newspaper, Xi Wu Bao, and appointed a young man called Liang Chichao to be its editor. And then in February 1898, the then sitting emperor asked to read copies of Huang's treatises on Japan. And in June, the emperor issued the decree declaring the beginning of what became known as the Hundred Days Reforms. Then in September, the palace coup forced the reformers to flee into exile and Huang retired to the countryside. But in retrospect, Huang did more than anyone to introduce the idea of race into the reform movement. 
The next figure is Yan Fu, who joined the Fuzhou Naval Shipyard, graduating into the Qing Navy in 1871. After six years as a naval officer, he was sent for further study at the Royal Naval College in Greenwich, London. He wanted to understand how Britain had become strong, and he found the answers in Herbert Spencer. In 1881, he read Spencer's The Study of Sociology, a book entirely predicated upon Spencer's racialist ideas. In 1895, following the defeat in the Sino-Japanese War, a new journal established by reformers in the Treaty Court of Tianjin gave Yan the space to publish four essays in rapid succession, introducing readers to Herbert Spencer's ideas on race. He borrowed Huang Zunxian's idea of the yellow race and told his readers that Manchu and Han and Mongol people were all part of this yellow race and that they needed to unite to fight off the whites. He also used Huang's word Zhong as an equivalent to race. The story takes a different turn when Zhang Binlin gets involved. He had started as a reformer and in 1898 he'd written a summary of Yan Fu's translations of Herbert Spencer. However, the suppression of the Boxer Rising in 1900 turned him into a revolutionary. He now argued that the Manchu were the problem and were never going to voluntarily mix with the Han. Writing from exile in Japan, he argued that the Manchu had to be overthrown. He adopted the word Zhu, meaning a family lineage, as a marker of difference. Zhang enlarged its meaning from the local to the national. The Han became the Hanzu and the Manchu the Manzu. The two groups were rival lineages and therefore conflict between them became not just thinkable, but logical. So it was Zhang Binlin who joined the two terms, Zhong and Zhu, to form the, word, the modern word for race, Zhong Zhu. We can say that Zhang Binlin invented the Han race in 1900. I'll turn a bit to history. Now, of course, histories had long been written in the region. However, in the 1890s and 1900s, new ways of writing history were introduced. Some people writing them had the explicit purpose of animating a Chinese nation. The, a key figure in the introduction of national history was a British Baptist ministry called Timothy Richard. He actually went to China in 1870 to preach Christianity, but by the 1890s, he was vocally advocating political reform as secretary of the Society for the Diffusion of Christian and General Knowledge among the Chinese, the SDK, sometimes known as the Christian Literature Society or the CLS. In 1894, as the defeats in the Sino-Japanese War became ever more humiliating, the SDK produced a Chinese translation of a British book, The 19th Century a History by Robert Mackenzie. The purpose of the book was to show how Britain and France had emerged from Napoleonic wartime and poverty to become world powers. The translation was a sensation. 4,000 official copies were sold in a fortnight and the historian Mary Mazur estimates that in all, around a million copies, both official and pirated, were sold. In 1895, Richard met the leading reformer Kang Yu Wei for the first time and became a founding member of Kang's reformist lobby group, the Strengthening Study Society. And at the same time, Liang Chichao volunteered to work as Richard's secretary, helping with his translations and his dealings with officials. Richard also introduced, introduced Liang Chichao to social Darwinist ideas, and they ensured they inspired Liang to develop his idea of the group, or Chun, as the best way to ensure its survival. Liang developed his idea of the importance of the group into a single-minded focus on the nation as the engine of history. In 1898, following the palace coup against the reforms, Liang Chichou and Kang, Liang Chichou and Kang Yo Wei fled into exile, where they would remain until the, after the 1912 revolution. Liang in Yokohama, Kang in various parts of the British Empire. In 1901, Liang published what would become the founding text for the Chinese new history his History of China introductory essay. In it, he laid down the intellectual foundations upon which a nation will be defined and built. He writes of a place called Zhongguo, China, and declares that this Zhongguo is comprised of a single people with a history that binds them together and makes them different from their neighbors. He tore up the traditional ways of writing histories of dynasties and adopted a European classification of ancient, middle age, and modern. Liang wanted to modernize but also to preserve the Qing great state. And he needed an ideology that justified his arguments. He found it in a European view of history based on a social Darwinist view of progress in which the authenticity of a nation was provided by its ostensibly ancient roots. So Liang's ideas about how to write national history were developing in parallel with his ideas about the nation. He was actually frustrated by the population's inability 
to take themselves seriously as a nation. And it was Liang Tichao who gave the Chinese language a translation for the word nation, but one that created problems which are still with us today. This was inspired by the work of a Swiss German scholar, Johann Bluntschli, already well known to reformers in Japan. In a 1903 essay, Liang adopted Bluntschli's language and reasoning. Bluntschli made a distinction between what he called in German, the nation, by which he meant confusingly for English people, the word people. Bluntschli's nation or people became Liang's Minzu. He chose Minzu with a literal meaning of people lineage. Equally confusingly, Bluntschli used the German word Volk in the sense of the English word nation. Liang translated folk or nation as Guomin. So for Bluntschli and Liang, there could be several peoples or Minzu in a state, and a Minzu could even exist across borders. Guomin, on the other hand, described the citizens of a state. For Liang, a Guomin could include several Minzu, and since the future of the yellow race depended upon the unity of all the groups within the Qing great state, he argued for a greater nationalism, a Da Minzu Juyi, to bring them together. Now he and Sun Yat-sen feared, had shared a social, a sorry, social Darwinist fear of yellow race extinction at the hands of the whites. But just as importantly, neither of them had any time for the Han racialism of people like Zhang Bin Lin. Liang saw Manchus as part of the same yellow race as the Han, and Sun was opposed to the Manchu as a corrupt elite, but not as a racial group. However, in the subsequent uh, arguments between reformists and revolutionaries, which I haven't got time to go into, the uh, debate about who actually formed the Minzu uh, became somewhat corrupted, and we end up with rather uh, different definitions of what Minzu actually means, with Sun Yat-sen arguing for a single Zhonghua Minzu, or Chinese nation, whereas uh, Liang Chichao was prepared to accept that Minzu were different groups living uh, within a, a state, within a citizenry, if you like, to use another uh, English word. Um, the problem was that there was a political dispute here which had to be reconciled between Liang who wanted to, and Sun who wanted to maintain the maximum territory of the Qing state, uh, where some of the Han-based uh, revolutionaries, people like Zhang Bin Lin, were happy to maybe to let go of some of the, uh, uh, the outer regions, the Manchu, Mongol, uh, Tibetan regions, um, and Han concentrate on a China proper, a Han state, as it were. And so the compromise that ends up coming together is one in which the, the actual definition of uh, Manchu, so of, of Minzu, uh, remains contested. Now, I think I'm running out of time, aren't I, Alan? <laughs> so shall I? Uh, almost, I'll, almost. Right. I'll, I'll just quickly skip through. I mean, another example is the word territory. Um, and um, the word territory, or the Chinese word lingtu, arrives uh, in Chinese via Japanese. So again, it's Herbert Spencer and his text uh, which discusses territorial issues, which is translated into Japanese, uh, and it uses this Japanese word ryodo. And then we, when Liang Chichao translates uh, into uh, a Japanese novel into Chinese, he uses the same characters linked to, and that's how we get the word territory uh, arrives uh, in, in the Chinese language. Um, and you can see that the argument of the territory and actually the defining the territory of the state uh, were never settled during the Republican period. And you had different ideas about territory versus domain or, or Jangyu. And this, the words kept changing depending on whether uh, the revolutionaries or, or um, uh, Yuan Shikai uh, or whoever was running the state at the time. So it remained an unsolved question really right uh, until, the, uh, until the revolution of 1949. So I'll leave it there uh, just for time and um, then we can um, have a discussion. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the very rich uh, presentation. Now, the rest of this event will pan out as follows. Uh, I've been listed together with uh, Assistant Professor Gong Xue of the China program here at RSIS as discussants. Now, uh, since I have an, the simultaneous duty of being the chair, I shall limit my remarks on uh, Bill Hayton's book to just... Uh, five to eight minutes, all right? And I'll leave the rest of the time to Assistant Professor Gong Xie, whom I will introduce shortly. Now, um, let me just uh, say these things about the book. Uh, I compliment uh, Bill Hayton for a very well-written, a very gripping account, and a clear mastery of micro-narratives. 
Now here's where it gets really interesting. I couldn't quite tell if this was a political commentary or a piece of history writing, all right? Uh, why do I raise this? Because there is a distinction here. Because if this were a kind of political commentary, since uh, almost every chapter ends with some kind of uh, indictment or criticism of uh, President Xi Jinping's policies, um, I would think that uh, you, you need to devote uh, a bit more comparative uh, study or contextualization to how you view modern China today vis-a-vis uh, -vis its peers, all right? Uh, here, I would encourage you to, if in the event that you, you wish to revise this uh, in a second edition or write a sequel to it, that uh, you need to keep in mind uh, that uh, the context of civilizational transitions, which is what I think your book is mostly about, needs to have this uh, attention to uh, the stresses of transition from one civilizational climate to another uh, because the unstated subtext, uh, and interestingly, you mentioned Herbert Spencer, uh, is that you're talking of a China trying to make the transition from tradition to modernity. And of course, tradition has got multiple dimensions. So would modernity. In fact, today, uh, those of us who conduct interdisciplinary research in the social sciences will say that there are multiple modernities, all right? And, and whole scholars have, uh, I mean, whole sets of scholarships have built reputations on the idea that there's a variegated set of modernities out there. Uh, I would have thought that you would reference works by Benedict Anderson, Ernest Gellner, Eric Hobsbawm, where you talk about nation nationalism being, uh, you know, intrinsically invented. Uh, forms of politics, uh, can we not also put, you know, the preface of your book side by side with things that are happening, say, in the United Kingdom itself, you know, uh, in the wake of Brexit, you, you suddenly hear this rhetoric from Edinburgh saying that, oh, we need to reinvent the United Kingdom without Scotland, or rather we reinvent Scotland without the United Kingdom. Uh, the, and the same thing is potentially happening across the English Channel in continental Europe. Was the European project uh, intrinsically from the start a Franco-German story uh, and, and so on, you know? Uh, and of course, uh, we can't call out the definitive result uh, of the American presidential elections just yet, but you're beginning to hear, okay, if you use your lenses to look at what's been happening in the last 72 hours, Two Americas coming to the fore, you know, represented by the two candidates for uh, the presidency of the United States. So, you know, it begs a question, if this were a political commentary, I think you need to uh, make it clear that it was necessary perhaps for this multitude of intellectuals to, ha to have helped the present elite of China in their little ways, perhaps unscripted, unorchestrated, to imagine the nation uh, however, you know, uh, artificial it might be. Now, following from that, I want to raise this issue which resonates across all of Asia, not just China. The shock of modernity to Asian societies. The displacement of values was a very serious political earthquake and also in many families, a personal earthquake. Uh, you know, when the science rationality the idea of power and the need to push back against power, the idea of checks and balances, become the way you look at society and government. Uh, you have to understand uh, when, when you argue that uh, the, these intellectuals that you mentioned in the presentation were taken in by Herbert Spencer and any number of uh, Western intellectuals from uh, two centuries ago, uh, were they prepared to say that tradition has to have a line drawn under it definitively, and then everything else has to be forward. Uh, again, the, the shock of modernity upon Asian societies is something that most of us who study Asia, either in politics, history, sociology, etc., um, are still grappling with. Uh, do we completely sever any study of uh, tradition? It's because it is beyond history, beyond present history. Or is it a case of trying to understand why 
Asian modernities will not re represent Western modernities. Um, and finally, Asian studies and Asian research on IR, international relations, are increasingly trending towards recovering the past. Uh, what do you say to that? Uh, in fact, I, I have a little bit of quarrel with the way you represent the uh, quarrel between China and Japan over the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, you know, as I understand it from scholars based, uh, you know, between Taiwan and Japan, looking at certain indigenous sources from the Qing period, um, you know, the Chinese gave way not because of a realist power play, you know, uh, because they wanted to hold on to the idea that this was a Confucian worldview, all right? The father needs to think of the best interests of the children. So if the children were being threatened by an outsider and Japan, modernizing Japan under the Meiji period, uh, was considered an outsider, totally drunk on Westphalian style uh, real politic. So to preserve this idea that uh, Tianxia was still, in a sense, benign, benevolent, and thinking of the best interests of the subordinates, they had to find a modus vivendi with uh, the outsider Japan under Meiji control and, and so on. All right, so I leave it there. And uh, now let me quickly introduce uh, my good colleague, um, Assistant Professor Kong Xue, who is from the China program. Uh, I've always known her uh, to have uh, gotten her spurs in the study of political economy, but she's a person also of very varied interests, as I found out uh, over the past six months since I've had to work closely with her on a number of webinars as well. And I think uh, there is no better person to uh, provide additional commentary to spark discussion on Bill Hayton's book than the, uh, Assistant Professor Kong Xue. Uh, and she's also very well published. She's published in uh, International Affairs, the Pacific Review, Contemporary Southeast Asia and even the Harvard Asia Quarterly. All right, uh, Kong Shui, you have the floor. Please keep uh, your remarks to 15 minutes at most. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, right, two years ago, when I first met Bill in Victoria, Canada, he introduced me his ongoing project, How China Was Invented. I was immediately struck by the word invention, which seemed, which seemed to suggest you know, China didn't exist, countering to my knowledge that China actually exists for more than 3,000 years. So during lunch, he shared how he traced historical archives, you know, conducted interviews with academics, scholars, historians working on China, formal, formally and informally. Uh, but now I think Bill's book comes right in time when we're encountering different, but also difficult issues in the region and the world. For example, the sovereignty dispute issues in the South China Sea, identity politics among Beijing, Hong Kong and Taipei, ethnicity policies on Tibet and Xinjiang. Since Bill introducing his book, um, I'm not gonna repeat. I want to highlight what fascinates me most is how we can actually draw many similarities of Bill's storytelling uh, to the current global affairs. For example, in a chapter of Zhu Quan, the sovereignty, Bill spent lots of space on analyzing uh, the role of uh, Li Hongzhang, a Chinese politician, general, and diplomat of the late Qing dynasty, who advocated for self-strengthening movement, but also the one who signed the humiliating treaty of Shimonoseki, Xingchou Tiaoyue, with the Japanese in 1895. While earlier this year, in January, when the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He went to see the current president, uh, Donald Trump, who is still in power, don't know if he's next year, um, for the phase one deal agreement, the Chinese netizens are furious by uh, Liu He's uh, compromise offering offered to the United States. And, they, and then they made unflattering comparisons between Liu He and Li Hongzhang. So on the one hand, we have been hearing arguments that rising powers like China have challenged the legitimacy of treaties, territorial settlements, and global governance. On the other hand, China can be uh, relatively accommodating just as some of the historical episodes showed in Bill's book. In analyzing these issues, Bill adopts an outsider inside approach to integrate Chinese history. Obviously, Bill is not the first one. Professor John Fairbank from Harvard University, Professor uh, Wang Gengwu from NUS, et cetera, they have all successfully helped uh, the intellectual society in integrating China. Nonetheless, Bill used to be a journalist had a unique way of interpreting China in a very interesting way. 
First of all, other than relying on existing archives interviews, Bill paid special attention to details how the center of the world began to accept the Westphalian definition of sovereignty, which you should find out in his book. For example, how the Qing dynasty employed an American uh, in negotiating with Russian over the border uh, disputes. Bill rightly puts that uh, the foreign constructions actually formed the China um, by missionaries, diplomats, traders, overseas Chinese with knowledge acquired abroad. China's history, in fact, has been assimilating and adopting ideas, concepts, and approaches since the Qing Dynasty. Uh, for example, the Dr. Sun Yat-sen invented the three principles, uh, nationalism, democracy, and livelihood, Minzu, Mingquan, Mingshen. The foreign construction has always been with China um, since then, although Bill didn't really cover his book. For example, how the Communist Party adopted Marxism, how Deng Xiaoping uh, took the journey of exploring the market economy experiments, and how China begins to assimilate the idea of modern governance, but with caution. In Bill's book, he quoted Yan Fu, a well-known Chinese scholar, that American style of democracy is not ready for China, which nowadays uh, many in China still echo with Yan Fu. That partially could explain why the Communist Party insists exploring a more appropriate and fitting way for the Chinese people to enjoy democracy with Chinese characteristics. Um, back to the notion of sovereignty, which is one of the highlights of, of his book, the, the Qing Dynasty tribunal system was harshly uh, smashed by the Western gun and boats diplomacy on the one hand, and the belief in the emperor as the son of the heaven was also destroyed on the other. So those political activists at that moment were struggling with who they are, and what is the future for the dynasty. So when interacting with the foreigners, the demand for dignity also grew. From, from uh, comparing with other, otherness, these Chinese political activists constructed an identity for the Chinese people in the hope to unite them in search for dignity, not just sovereignty. Bill tries to tell readers why China's use sovereignty as a moral and dignity imperative instead of legal imperative in the issue areas such as Taiwan and even the South China Sea. So the invention of China and the Chinese people are successful and effective. For example, in um, Qinghai Revolution, in building the first Republic Chinese state and in anti-Japanese war. And because of the effectiveness and easy to use, the CCP picked it up to govern the people of the state and to develop its economy. The last point I want to highlight Bill's interpretation of using history to understand CCP and the future for the world. Bill seems to suggest that the nation building by the CCP may lead to the scenario that Asia will repeat Europe's past and China may become a fascist. Such debate has been ongoing for decades, such as in Aaron Friedberg's uh, article. If um, the realists are right, it is suggested that it will be very difficult for the Asian states to achieve a stable and lasting peace in Asia as it was in Europe in the early 20th century. But for some others, it may also suggest a return to the hierarchical relationship in, China, uh, in Asia that has deep roots in Confucianism and also uh, reflecting the material power. So for almost 2000 years before the arrival of the Western powers, the East Asian notion of interstate relations were Sinocentric. Most of the states in the region have long traditions either cooperating with China or being subordinate to China, suggested by Samuel Huntington. He even suggests that instead of repeating the European patterns of international politics, Asia is more likely to replace on. Asia's past will be Asia's future. So here I want to highlight, Bill raised the warning bar in his book that the history may repeat itself. But I want to highlight David Kant's words, to study the role of history is hardly to predict that it will re replicate itself in the future. It is a warning, but not a prediction. As a great book, it usually comes with controversy, which I'm going to provide my humble opinion as a non-Chinese historian, but a scholar on China in international political economy. You, Abiyo, you have every right to naysay what I put here. Okay, first of all, I find out somehow it is uh, a little bit problematic uh, in terms of case and time selection. Bill can provide a more compelling case if he has examined China's history in a, in a continuous way. Um, instead, um, 
he has selectively chosen part of China's history, which is uh, Qing Dynasty and partially history on the Republic China to draw a point, which may not be representative of the complete picture. By relating Qing Dynasty, uh, the Republic of China and Xi Jinping's role, it seems to downplay the periods of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping in particular. For Mao Zedong, who initiated the disasters uh, in what looking cultural revolution, destruction of the Confucianism and people's beliefs, norms and religion that history has proved. And but 30 years later, Deng Xiaoping studied to modernize China, mostly by learning development experiences from its Asian fellows, such as Japan and Singapore on developed state model. So the foreign construction is not just on the West, but also on the East. The case elections seems to overblow the Western influence while overlooking the internal drives of China to construct itself. That's first point. And my second point is somehow I feel it is a bit overemphasis on the impact of Xi Jinping's national building um, polit policies uh, that includes identity and ethnicity policies in Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and elsewhere in China. The majority of the narratives on CCP national uh, or nation building policies in the is that the ruling party is suppressing local identity, identities of minorities, um, as well as in Hong Kong, while CCP is trying to impose identity, identities with the Taiwanese. The under, underlying meaning is that people should be careful of the CCP's national building uh, project. Bill's book echoes with that kind of narrative. While I'm not saying that such arguments are wrong, I think such narratives need more careful examination by relating to the global political economy. So since mid 2000, the momentum toward an increasingly open and liberal world order began to falter and people began to question globalization and integration. So the shift actually coincided with two financial crises. The first one originated from the US in 2008 and the second one emerged over the threat to the Euro and the EU post by racist insolvency issues. So in both cases, the elite policies produce huge uh, recessions, high levels of unemployment and failing economies, which triggers the, the anti-globalization sentiment. In other parts of the world, the 2011 Arab Springs that later turned out to be civil wars in Libya, um, uh, Yemen, Iraq, and, and Syria, while in 2014, the desire for democracy and a local identity spread to Hong Kong as well, opening uh, publicly the local and central frictions. Later on, we see a series of black swans that included Brexit, election of Donald Trump, and more national leader, nationalist leaders in democracies uh, being on the spotlight, which also includes the election of President Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan. So many of those elections in democracies share one similarity, mobilizing nationalism and localism, distinguishing us from others. So could this be also applied to China's case despite no elections or referendum? I use Hong Kong as a case to challenge Bill's argument that Xi Jinping's rule um, uh, sort of disturbed the Hong Kong's uh, appeal for democracy. According to the public opinion program by Hong Kong University conducted from 1997 to 2013, the percentage of Hong Kongers identifying themselves as Hong Konger was more than 40% in 1999, but it was, but the identity of being Hong Konger was only 17% uh, in 2008, while the identity of being Chinese is almost, was almost 40%, surprisingly. However, such identity reversed since 2010, and the identity of being a Hong Konger peaked at more than 45% in 2012, and the figure uh, updated to June of 2012. The June 2012 was a watershed. It was, but it was before the current president Xi Jinping came into power. So why the identity changed even without a stronger interference uh, by Xi Jinping? So how such change actually correlated with the global anti-globalization and integration sentiment? My point here is China probably may not be an exception in the global trend that think, them, think about themselves and society in identity terms. Look at the identity politics in Europe, in the United States. They are still divided by the left and right and by racist to some extent. So how can we single out these issues uh, a result of CCP's role? Well, it could be the structural problems at the global economy, right? So it claimed China's current policy in Xinjiang, Taiwan, and, and Tibet, um, as well as the South China Sea is the past, informs, uh, is the past that informs the present. 
Is it, isn't it also part of the claims by the Republic of China as well? Would it be any different if Republic of China still rules China? As a hypothetical question, it's very difficult to answer. But how can we be so sure all the inventions of programs is a unique thing of the CCP? Why CCP is so exceptional? So Bill suggests that China has been flattening internal differences on the interest of national unity. Perhaps China's approach could be an attractive option for many countries, especially when the US and the EU as exemplars of liberal democracy are having their own problems now. So overall, it is a very engaging book. I believe once you read it, you will be guided by Bill's words in, in encountering historians, reformers, conservativists, while with those interesting historic anecdotes, uh, which I have no idea of, it feels like you are one of these figures witnessing the world order changes. You can find out the clues of Chinese aspirations and ideas <clears throat> in the book. It is a great book that definitely ignite us to discuss about China. And also it is a book um, about a reflection on how shall we integrate and judge the history. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Assistant Professor Gong Xue. Uh, now, in the interest of uh, uh, igniting a wider ranging discussions, okay, I will try not to respond to too many of the questions uh, myself, unless specifically directed to me. I would uh, shepherd them directly to Bill and uh, Gong Xue. All right. Uh, now, before I ask Bill to respond, since this is his book after all, uh, can I roll in um, two questions uh, from uh, the four that have been gathered so far on the Q&A channel uh, into uh, your response? Uh? Uh, the question by Matt Hensel, for instance, asks if uh, you see any link to the process, uh, again, I referred to, to this author, to Ben Anderson's idea of the imagined community. Uh, you know, did you see a parallel in the way the CCP has tried to imagine, okay, this uh, China dream, the once and, and the present and future prosperous China uh, as a deliberate uh, set of policies that will be locked in? Uh, and uh, Matt Hansel also wraps this question into this uh, imagining uh, by asking also if uh, you think that uh, when uh, the CCP single-mindedly pursues this uh, obsession with building domestic legitimacy by narrating the history of the Chinese nation in a certain way, is it going to impact its foreign policy? All right. Uh, Kong Shia, please keep these questions in mind as well. I'll come to you in a short while. Okay, Bill, you have the floor first. Right. Thank you very much, Alan. And to Shreya, that's um, really good comments. Thank you. Um, so I, can I just run through them as, as, I, as I made notes, if that's all right? So I'll start with Alan, and then I'll go on to, on to um, uh, Shreya. Um, so you, you asked at the outset, is it political commentary or is, or is it history writing? Well, I suppose my, my cheap answer is that it's trying to be both. Um, it's trying to look at contemporary issues, uh, which... Uh, bother the world about China. You know, South China Sea was where I started, but Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang have all been mentioned. And try to kind of show uh, where these problems have their roots. I mean, you know, you could go all the way back, you know, centuries to talk about the emergence of, you know, different political formations or whatever. But I thought this transition from the empire to the republic was, was key in this, with all the changes in definition about um, nation and, and, and so forth. Um, what that meant, as Shreya pointed out, was that, you know, I kind of, I skipped over the, <laughs> the whole post-1949, you know, Mao and Dong period, because I was trying to show how modern issues have roots that go way back before the revolution and to try and show, or the communist revolution, and show how they are, there are commonalities between what communists are doing now what the nationalists were doing in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, and to some extent that maybe looks at um, Shreya's sort of question at the end, you know, how would it be different if the Republic had remained in charge in 1949? In some ways it might actually be exactly the same in some of these kind of um, uh, nationality questions because the communists built uh, to some extent on the, on the nationalities issue. Although in the book, I do talk about how um, 
in the 30s under the influence of Stalin um, and the Comintern, not just on the communists, but actually also on the nationalists about how the, uh, the, the nationalists were obliged to kind of follow a, a Stalinist model of nationalities. And there was this tension between do you define national minorities and give them autonomy or do you try and kind of smooth them out and make them a single Chinese nation, a single Zhonghua Minzu? And, and this tension has been there, you know, you know from the 1920s uh, onwards. Uh, but I'll come back to that. Um, so, I mean, you were, I mean, it, it's interesting how you phrased it, Alan. You were said, you know, talking about a, of a China trying to make a transition to modernity, moder to modernity which sort of makes me think that you have, uh, the, there's an, this idea that there was this primordial China that was there, which was waiting to come out into the open, which is, a, in my view, that's, a, that's an idea that Liang Qichao invented. You know, that there wasn't a primordial China, that you had a civilization, you had a shared culture, and um, that sort of thing, but there wasn't necessarily a belief that there was a, you know, a plate, well, certainly not called China, because China is an English word, but was it called Zhongguo, was it called Zhonghua? What were the different, you know, was it called Hua Sha? You know, all of these uh, arguments were live debates in the 1890s and 1900s about, you know, you know what was this country that, you know, was supposed to be there that, 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 that hadn't come into the modern world. Um, and so, yes, it does, and which goes to um, Matt's question. Yes, this, this book is founded on Benedict Anderson, you know, kind of that's, you know, that's where I, you know, when I was at university, 30 years ago, you know, that was what I, you know, grew up on is, you know, with Benedict Anderson and ideas of nation. Um, I think Anderson gets a couple of mentions in the book, but it's not explicitly about it. It just assumes that um, imagined community is, is kind of the, the starting point for studies of nation. Um, and, um, you know, Gellner and Hobsbawm, you know, are kind of informing, you know, my, you know, my thinking, but they're not, I mean, I mentioned Smith and his ideas of, of groups and things and nations in the, in the conclusion. Um, they're there, but not necessarily uh, in a front and center. And, and you're absolutely right that, you know, um, identities shift and change. Um, and this, I think, links in a bit with the Shua's point about, about Hong Kong. Um, so, um, you know, you can contrast, uh, I think, how identities uh, form and, and reform. I mean, the idea that there would be such a thing as a Hong Kong nation um, would have been ridiculous at, at certain points in time. Um, but now, obviously, there are people in Hong Kong that openly advocate the idea that there is a, um, you know, there is a Hong Kong nation. Um, and it has, you know, and clearly that identity has been born out of a sense of struggle with a mainland identity. I mean, you know, you can, you know, try and think of other examples where that has happened. I mean, the fact there's an East Timor, Timor-Leste identity, which is different from an Indonesian identity, is only really ex explainable by the different colonial experiences of uh, East and West uh, Timor, for example. Um, so identities can shift. And, you know, there's this word ethnogenesis, the idea that nations and ethnic groups and identities, you know, can emerge and how do they emerge. Um, I think shows us that they're, you know, these things are not fixed and they're not primordial. Um, and in the UK, as you point out, you know, we are uh, probably about to, in the next few years, go through another round of, of debates about Scottish independence and so forth. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, I think that, I mean, if you look at the sort of the periodization uh, across Europe, we had a kind of century from 1848, the nationalist sort of liberal revolutions of 1848, up to the end of the Second World War in 1945, which was the kind of the high point of the nation state in Europe, where people were trying to break away from the Austro-Hungarian Empire or whatever and say, no, I am Czech and I'm Hungarian or I'm German, I'm French. Um, and the result was a century of war, genocide um, and instability. Um, and after 1945, the idea of coming together, the reduction of the importance of borders, autonomy for minorities, freedom of movement, these kind of things became more important. And we moved back to a kind of a pan-national view of a continent um, where a lot of these um, uh, disputes were, were moderated because the practical issues that people objected to about minorities being on different sides of borders and things, they could be, um, they could be ameliorated. Um, I mean, we're seeing tensions now, but I think you know, in, the, in the EU, as in the other 28 states, um, not including the UK, 
they don't really seem to be territorial questions. I mean, uh, Catalonia would be the, the exception to that. In the UK, it's becoming territorial again. It, it's Scotland, it's Wales, it's Ireland. And interestingly, COVID has made that more uh, acute because we've had different rules in different parts of the UK, which has probably emphasized this. Um, in the Americas, um, it doesn't seem to be a territorial question. These identity questions are ones about what it means to be an American, but it's not about, at the moment, it's not about Texas breaking away you know, from the union or something. Um, and whether we're gonna talk about, I mean, it's interesting what we'll be talking today, you know, are we gonna, I can imagine journalists now, depending on what happens in Pennsylvania, it's like, it's either gonna be, you know, populism advances or populism retreats, you know, and it'll just entirely depend on an election result in, in one state. Um, yeah, so going on, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of scattering, scattering around now. Um, I mean, I, I try to look at, um, you know, kind of um, the, the, the commonalities between different conceptions of, of Chinese nationalism, whether that's, um, is you know the original nationalist idea of the sort of early part of the 20th century or the later you know, communist uh, ones? Um, I, I think that that's important because as the PRC moves towards a more nationalist mode of legitimation, it's already there, I guess. I think this this will become even stronger. Um, it's interesting that um, the first time I encountered Timothy Richard, uh, I was at the Communist Party Museum at the former site of Peking University in Beijing. Um, and I think Timothy Richard is the first picture that you see in the um, after Marx and Engels themselves in the museum, because Timothy Richard was the first person to use the words Marx and Engels in Chinese in one of his uh, translations. So he gets a special uh, place in the history of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but what I, um, I, I didn't want to say that China was um, unique in this. Um, but I think it's interesting because I think all states have been have gone through this invention process. Um, in some, in, you know, Britain, in Italy, in Germany, it was about building up fragments of a, of a putative nation or country into a whole. Um, whereas, of course, in in China, well, with the Qing Empire, you have and you could contrast it with what happened with the Ottoman Empire. So both of them were extensive land empires, which ruled peoples that spoke different languages, different cultures. Um, the Ottoman Empire fragmented it's nine hours. and retreated to a core, uh, a Turkish speaking core, but obviously problems with you know, Kurdish and other minorities. And the Arab states went their own way. Whereas in the case of the Qing Empire, it was the territory was held together and the national question um, uh, was, was dealt with internally. Um, you know, and I think the, the contrast to why one went one way and one went the other is, 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 is interesting and important. But it's interesting, and if you look at the Arab states, I mean, they all share a culture, or, you know, a, the same written script, you know, largely, you know, uh, Muslim in belief, you know, with, with, with some uh, Christian elements and other elements. Um, and yet we don't, you know, there, there is an Arab nationalist dream uh, of that, you know, that all the Arabs are, are one people, but yet there are separate nation states, or separate states at least, you know, we're going to argue whether they're nation states. That could have been the future, the fate of the Qing Empire, if, if a different revolutionary outcome had happened, if the Han nationalists had basically won and, you know, the, and, and China had just become China proper and Tibet, Mongolia, Manchuria, uh, Xinjiang had kind of been allowed to, to, to go their own ways. We could have been in a different situation. I'm not saying it would have been better, but it would certainly have, have been, been different. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, my only other thought on the Ryutu um, point, uh, Alan, is that I think the Qing basically had no choice uh, but to give way uh, on Ryutu. And so uh, they had to put the best uh, spin, the best face possible on, on, on a fait accompli. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm prepared to, <laughs> to learn more about that if you, if you think there's a different thing. For me, I think the importance of the tribute system was for domestic political le legitimation. The idea that people were coming from abroad to pay tribute to the emperor in Beijing actually had a domestic political purpose, which is to say, look, all these outsiders recognize me as the leader, so you should too, domestic people. So actually, I think that's been rather underplayed in histories of tribute system, that it was really more for domestic consumption uh, than actually a way of ordering the region. But that's uh, another, another story. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, 
Gong Xue, would you like to weigh in on any of these issues before I launch the next set of questions at both of you? Not at this moment. <laughs> I think, okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, then uh, back to Bill. Now, uh, apparently, uh, a number of questions keep zeroing back uh, on uh, the identity issue. Uh, how uniquely is this nation building process in China that you've dealt with in the book uh, in terms of uh, whether you would be daring enough, bold enough to assign some uniquely Chinese characteristics to it? Uh, that's a question by John Huang. And uh, Edwina Shadik uh, asked if uh, Han exclusivism did not exist how did it creep into the official discourse? Okay, is this too much to handle? <laughs> um, well, on the second one, I am giving a talk on Monday for SOAS China Institute on, I've called it the invention of the Han race, just to wind people up. Um, and, and I'll go into a kind of bigger talk on the, on the race uh, question. So uh, feel free to, to come along to that. Um, but I mean, I, I think to, in summary, um, the, the Qing had already, um, when, when, they, when they took over uh, the Ming state, they had already had a division in their heads between uh, Han and, 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 and Man, between themselves and the people they were conquering. Um, I argue, well, I, I follow somebody else in arguing that um, Han was a word that people in Inner Asia had used to describe that lot, you know, the people over the hills. You know, it was a word that, it was a foreigner's word you know, people who were living in China, shall we say, called themselves Hua. They didn't call themselves Han, by and large. Uh, I'm waiting, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so when the Manchu, when the Qing arrive, they have this category for Han for the people that they're ruling. But actually, they're more used, they're more, and then the bigger distinction is between the military, the banner units, and the civilians, between Qi and Min. Um, and uh, Han becomes important in the context of the revolution, uh, in the context of the battle between the reformers who are basically trying to say, we don't need to uh, overthrow the empire, we can reform it from within. And so therefore the, the Manchu and the Han need to kind of you know, meld together and become a single people. Whereas the revolutionaries were saying, no, no, that's just impossible. We just got to get rid of these Manchu. And you know, for some people that just meant putting them from power, for some it meant expelling them physically Others, it actually meant genocide. So uh, that whole uh, notion of why Han becomes the identity is very much wrapped up between the arguments between reformers and revolutionaries around 1900. Um, how unique is China's nation building? Well, I mean, they're all unique, but they're all, <laughs> but they're unique and often in the same way. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, every case is is different, but you know, the idea of having to um, you know create sense of loyalty to a state and how you go about doing that. I mean, each uh, the, the techniques may be different in each case, um, but ultimately, if you're going to have a successful nation state, you've got to build uh, a loyalty to that. And you need ideas to do that. And you need uh, media and you need physical force and, and all the rest of it to kind of, you know, keep people within a certain you know, framework of, of seeing the world. But I, you know, I contrast it with the, the Ottoman Empire. Um, just to say that you know, there was no inevitability that the Qing Empire would become the Republic of China within the the, the, the same borders. And of course, you know, you know, between the revolution and you know, was 1950, um, you know, Tibet was functionally independent. You know, Mongolia, at least you know, the greater part of Mongolia breaks away. Xinjiang was under sort of autonomous rule for most of that time. You know, so you did actually have, in effect, a kind of rump China. Uh, a China proper for that period, um, but that's kind of forgotten now in the sort of post 1950 uh, situation. You know, they sort of seem that somehow they kind of we skip out that 40 year period when um, you know the real boundaries of China were far far smaller uh, than they are now. Okay, um, Gong Xue, would you like to respond to any of these issues? Uh, well. Um... I'm not very familiar with Chinese history, although being an ethnic Chinese. Um, so pardon me for that, but I want to highlight um, what, I, what I can reflect on Bill's book uh, 
join the importance of history in understanding today's China's foreign policy. First of all, I think uh, the sovereignty notion in China, whether it be you know Republic China or the current People's Republic China, I think uh, the common sense for the Chinese political elites that it is a useful um, concept for the Chinese state to defend its sovereignty, although there are disputes in um, you know um, in different parts uh, of the region. That's that that is reflected in the sense that. Uh, China proposed and also is one of the uh, one, one of the non-aligned movement members, right? Proposed the five principle um, five principles in its foreign relations, where the non-interference is heavily embedded in dealing with developing countries. I think that could be draw back to Bill's book on why the Chinese, uh, especially the Chinese political elites, they feel resentful uh, during the late Qing dynasty or even you know um, in the early stage of the Republic of China before it, uh, or before it was constructed. How 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 today's episodes can easily you know let back to the past sentiments. So that for that part, I want to highlight. And the second part is history has taught China. A, Good lesson about first of all is Mr. Democracy, and the second is Mr. Science, which in uh, the new movement. Um, but you see, China has selectively, you know, pick one, which is Mr. Science, where even the Chinese, the current Chinese leader, like Xi Jinping, emphasizing on self, uh, self reliance on the high tech development. Um, but why the Chinese uh, leaders they sort of. Uh, they sort of, you know, either ignore or they felt the Mr. Democracy is a very tricky, very controversial, a very hot potato uh, subject in, in their ruling. I think it's because they made this hasty conclusion that after experimenting for several times, like the Republic of China and also, you know, the student movement in Tiananmen, they, they, they probably felt, you know, echo as I, I, as, as I quoted from, um, Bill's book, that Yan Fu's work, democracy is not ready for China. And the Chinese people, or, or alternatively, Chinese people are not ready for it. It's very difficult to prove such arguments are correct, but it's it's sort of like an an idea, you know, heavily already heavily embedded uh, in the political elites, and it's very difficult to foresee it will it's going to change. But I've seen China has been assimilating ideas, not just in the historical episodes, but in today's uh, the global governance where uh, the Chinese leaders, they began to, for example, in my area, they began to accept the notion of development financing. But what is different from uh, you know, the development financing provided by the IMF or the World Bank is that it creatively uh, coined a way by connecting both commercial benefits to the Chinese companies while providing the, uh, the, the concessional loans to the developing countries. So by showing to the rest of the world, especially the developing countries that, you know, while being still developing, we can provide some alternatives to the world. And that actually could also be drawing from the history that um, China's days of being uh, tortured, of, 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 of being grilled, of being invaded has gone as a developing force. It can represent the interests and uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, ideology among those developing countries. So that's what I can take from uh, Bill's book, and I try to relate to my to my expertise. <laughs> yeah. Mm, okay. Wonderful. Um, now let me also roll uh, another two questions uh, into one for both uh, Bill and Gong Xue. Um, there apparently is this uh, interest in whether uh, Beijing's posturing about nationalism, whatever, despite whatever labels uh, Xi Jinping or his cabinet ministers use, uh, you know, this is for a certain target audience, both domestic and overseas. But if you happen to need to deal directly with Xi Jinping's government or Xi Jinping himself, in private, they're willing to be a bit more flexible. Okay, they might invoke the discourse, all right, a la Teng Xiaoping of pragmatism. All right. Uh, what have both of you got to say about that? All right. So these are the two questions by, uh, okay, as I have it here, mm -hmm. Mr. Fang Yi Yang and Frederick Kim. Yes. Okay, Bill, you have a go first. I'll have a go. Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, one of the things, you know, that's, um, is different between 
present day PRC and uh, you know kind of the Europe of the 1930s is that you know there is a what there seems to be a clear line around the PRC's territorial agenda. Um, I mean, it's um, you know it's Taiwan, it's you know the Himalayas, bits of the Himalayas, um, and various uninhabited islands uh, in the sea. Um, it's not as if we're gonna we we don't see a, a discourse, at least not yet, of trying to overturn um, historical boundaries, you know, in Central Asia or you know, kind of Manchuria. Um, we don't see a, a kind of a claim that everywhere that has a sort of Chinese minority, um, you know, needs to be come back to the motherland type thing. So there's a, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the optimistic view is that there's a clear line around uh, any territorial changes that the PRC would like to, to see in the world. Of course, the, the bad news is that, you know, even those, uh, you know, lines are causing conflict um, in, in the region. Um, so... The, the the posturing, I think, I mean, posturing is a kind of negative word, but I, I you know, I have no doubt that this narr you know, the narratives are genuinely believed by the leadership and la and large portions of the, the Chinese population, um, uh, and uh, as they, you know, in many you know cases, you know, they they become the accepted narrative of uh, of China's um, the last century of, of, of Chinese history. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I hoped by writing the book was by showing how um, these things were are not sort of ancient and um, you know kind of permanent. Um, you know, it would actually show how there is space for compromise on some of these questions that they aren't uh, questions of, um, of of national survival. Yet, uh, um, governments, you know. All around the world, um, uh, make you know, you know, seek obviously the legitimacy, the support of their their peoples, and, and rallying around um, you know ideas of humiliation seems to be uniquely powerful. I mean, I've been looking um, in my South China Sea work at, um, at Vietnam, and when Vietnamese became interested in the South China Sea islands, and it's interesting that although the in the early part of the nineteen sorry early part of the twentieth century in the mid part. The first the French and then the Vietnamese governments were taking actions in the South China Sea. They didn't really excite the population. It was only when in 1974, when there was a perceived humiliation that China invaded the Paracel Islands, suddenly it becomes an emotional issue, becomes a rallying point. So it kind of seems as if the idea of humiliation is really important for building national solidarity and, and support for governments. And you see this in China in the 1920s and 30s, it was deliberately cultivated, this idea of loss um, uh, of territory as a means of kind of mobilizing the population. And of course, with the Japanese attacking in the 30s, it became you know, an, an acute issue. Um, and so, you know, kind of nurturing this sense of, of loss and humiliation and the need to restore greatness is a, is a fantastic um, mobilizing force for Xi Jinping. Um, and it's, you know, it's worked in other places too. The question is, how long can you sustain it? How long can you tell people we're on a kind of, you know, march to greatness and all the rest of it, um, you know, before they think, hang on, no, we're not. <laughs> mm, interesting. Uh, Kong Xue, would you like to weigh in on any of these questions? Yes, uh, regarding the nas nationalism, I want to flip um, the narrative around on the bottom up nationalism, which actually the Chinese government find it more difficult to handle with. It's okay, I would agree, you know, nationalism can be um, designed from top down level, right, by for political, you know, propaganda purposes, etc. But nowadays, if you look around um, through the Chinese netizens' responses uh, towards some commodities, uh, towards those advertisements, there are some. There are many episodes that CCP cannot control because of the technology. For example, uh, in a Dolce Bagana luxury brand, right, um, which intentionally exclude Hong Kong and Taiwan as part of the Chinese sovereignty, and then it faced boycott from the Chinese citizens. And in Bill's book, he also highlighted uh, a case in the Gap. Uh, I think it's an American brand, uh, which also 
you know, encounter the same uh, boycott. But as the Chinese leadership is trying to show the world that Chinese market is still attractive, um, you know, um, by, by improving on its investment, you know, clauses on uh, improving its investment environments, etc. If the party cannot handle it with care, there will backlash. Those economic nationalism will definitely backlash Chinese government's efforts to build uh, a much more benign market for the world and for its legitimacy uh, itself. So I think uh, instead of um, giving, give, give in, instead of countering or 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 arguing with the Chinese government, I think we should have we should pay more attention to the Chinese netizens, to what extent they play a civil, uh, you know, the civil warrior role in Chinese foreign policy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, one last question uh, comes from Matthew Hensel. Okay, I shouldn't say last question because we still have roughly 13 minutes more to go. Um, he circled back to the issue uh, that Bill raised in his last closing comment. Um, now, in the imagination and invocation, I should add, of uh, nationalism, uh, would the CCP be running a risk by picking on issues that were actually defined by its predecessor, i.e. the nationalist government uh, under Yuan Shikai, Jiang Jiexu, and so on? Okay, Bill, would you like to take this on? Um. Yes, I mean, I guess, I mean, the, um, they are running a risk, of course. I mean, the risks are, are of conflicts. I mean, obviously, in the question, in the case of Taiwan, if we're, you know, or, uh, you know, potentially in the South China Sea, and obviously in the case of the Himalayas, there, you know, there have been literal conflicts. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I guess the party thinks that, you know, it can win um, and it has a purpose and a plan. Uh, over the long term. So in that sense, maybe they don't see it as being um, a risky venture and that they think their staying power is going to be greater than that. Um, I mean, the, I mean the, you know, for all the kind of shouting um, about the South China Sea, I mean, China hasn't really incurred any substantial costs I mean, it may have incurred opportunity costs, you know, things that um, you know, could have happened, you know, haven't happened. I mean, frankly, I think if China had done absolutely nothing in the South China Sea over the last 20 years, it would actually be in a stronger position than it is now. Um, because, you know, it's just its natural, you know, kind of rise, and, you know, size of its economy and all the rest of it would have caused a, a reordering. But by being uh, overly assertive, it's prompted a reaction um, which has you know, made its life far more difficult than it than it needed to have been. Um, and you know, and it's also proven, you know, in the case of Xinjiang, it is entirely possible to put millions of people in detention centres um, and um, not really suffer any consequences beyond some criticism on Twitter, frankly. Um, so you know, I don't, you know, I don't really see where the, you know where the risk really is to the leadership at this point, unless it's a kind of a long-term corrosion, whether it's a kind of um, a sense, you know, within China that uh, the leadership is going too far. Um, but I, you know, I don't really see the, where it's losing at the moment. Um, and, you know, I think this, the, the narrative is sufficiently powerful to, um, uh, to convince enough people uh, to, you know, stick with the leadership for the time being. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kongxia, would you like to weigh in on this question? Oh, I'm not very... <laughs> uh, as I said before, I'm not a historian. I, I, I really... Mm -hmm. I don't know that much about you know the South China Sea policy in, in Republic of China, although I read Bill's book. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on that, but I think um, I, I want to emphasize um, a line that um, if, I mean, for example, in the Southeast Asia, if China is mm. um, is genuinely uh, building relationship with the Southeast Asian countries, uh, the disputed South China Sea is is uh, you know um, is, is definitely a, a tangible barrier. Uh, but somehow, you know, 
lots of issues, including um, the interference uh, in Chinese words uh, from the United States have complicated such issue. I think it has pushed China back to the corner that it has to be more hawkish, has to be more aggressive. So in a way, I feel uh, ASEAN stances of being, you know, negotiating, you know, um, in a closed door, in a, in a, in a, a skillful way, probably would help um, reduce the tensions. But in terms of nationalism in, in the South China Sea issue, I think it is still manageable to the Chinese government compared to, the, to Hong Kong, compared to Taiwan, or even Tibet. Uh, because I don't see the Chinese government now in the media commentators, you know, highlighting uh, the, the importance or, or trying to elevate uh, to the equal importance of the Taiwan issue. So there are still some space um, for the both sides to, to, to handle, I think. Yeah. Okay, my, my own uh, two cents worth of response to Matthew Hansel on this question uh, is that one, uh, the CCP can always conveniently fall back on this catch-all strategy called the United Front because the United Front uh, emphasizes making expedient alliances against the most immediate common enemy you know, regardless of ideology. So, you know, uh, it can invoke this term to justify why it is taking over a claim, you know, produced by uh, its predecessor in terms of who controlled uh, the government in Beijing at that point in time. Uh, and of course, a more distant possibility as to how they can avoid uh, scandalizing uh, CCP foreign policy is to argue that, uh, you know, maps, regardless of who made them or drew them or legitimized them, as long as they were convincingly, uh, if, if they can convincingly be argued in the train of international law to have been produced by a legal and widely recognized successor or predecessor to a line of di distinct governments that occupied the seat of power in Beijing, why not? All right. Uh, I do know from my uh, understanding of other contested territories in Southeast Asia that if they were brought to an international tribunal, this was the way the parties argued their cases, regardless of ideology. If a predecessor that was widely recognized as legitimate at that point in time produced this map, I'm entitled at this point in time, 2020, to invoke a comparable legitimacy to, to showcase this map as evidence for my case uh, and, and so forth. All right. Um, I see that there are no further questions and we are down to the last six minutes. Um, okay. If there aren't, oh, there's, there's one more question. Just came in. Um, all right. I'll post this to Bill. What is the view within China to the, con towards the concept of ASEAN centrality with respect to the idea of China, both old and new? Uh, can this be squared with Xi Jinping's idea of community with shared future for mankind? All right. So uh, in, in short, uh, this question asks <laughs> if uh, the CCP can uh, perform the equivalent of, I suppose, uh, acrobatics with this imagination of uh, a future China, all right, a future Chinese great power that can be benign towards its southern neighbors, okay, uh, steering the future of uh, harmony within uh, the southern seas and so on, broadly yeah. along these lines. Okay, Bill? Uh, to be honest, I think Shreya will be probably better with this one, but <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, I mean, the community of shared future is, a, is an empty slogan in the words of a great new book, um, uh, but it's being filled with concepts. I think fundamentally it's, it's based on the idea of sovereignty, and this idea of sovereignty is about individual nation states facing one another alone, and that it's fundamentally hostile to alliances um, and grouping together of smaller states. You can see that in the way the, uh, the, the China deals with the EU and the whole 16 plus one, 17 plus one thing. Um, and I, I mean, uh, and I think there's a you know more of a there's a preference for dealing with with governments rather than alliances and collectives. However, um, it, that's a big topic. Um, and I think there's something, going back to what you said earlier, there's this, you know, there's, there's something of a moral imperative given to sovereignty, I think here, which um, uh, is, I think, different from the way 
that uh, people, in, I'm generalizing, you know, certainly people in Europe, in the EU, think that sovereignty is a relative concept. The UK, I would have said the same thing until Brexit, but you know, there's different points of view here. But it seems to me that for, for many Chinese thinkers, you know, sovereignty is some kind of absolute moral uh, purpose, um, which I think is different from the way many Europeans see it. But I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Gongxia, would you like to weigh in on this question about the, the ASEAN centrality? Oh, okay. I was going to address the other one, but okay. Um, I think ASEAN centrality to a certain extent uh, has benefited China, uh, especially uh, after the Tiananmen you know, incident um, when China was eager to join the international society as well as the regional uh, blocs, where China benefited from the support from ASEAN member states. And um, even nowadays, the Chinese scholars, those influential ones in Chinese uh, government affiliate think tanks, they spoke highly of uh, of the centrality of ASEAN that gave China a stage to you know, participate in ASEAN plus three, for example, in uh, East Asian summit, et cetera. But however, you know, you know, um, it, according to the structural, uh, uh, the, the structural realism, you'll find out once the powers started to you know, rise, started to uh, climb up to a certain stage, the centrality inevitably will be marginalized, uh, especially when you hear less and less in Chinese political elites, you know, public speech. Um, to me, uh, somehow the centrality is still very useful uh, as a buffer zone for, for China and the United States, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in the great power rivalry. But it goes to back to the point of ASEAN, how they conceptualize centrality themselves and how can they safeguard the centrality. And regarding the narratives on the shared future, I agree that it's an empty slogan. It has been repeat repeatedly you know, uh, shown in Chinese um, leadership. For example, the peaceful rise, coexistence, harmonious society um, by Hu Jintao, for example. Um, those actually show that China has no uh, you know, uh, universal value to show the world, unlike the West, especially the United States. What it can do is try to borrow the ideas from history where um, Bill in, in introduced a bit on his book about the Datong, the, the conception of the great harmony. I think almost most of those um, foreign policy slogans, uh, you know, resemble the past. And I think you can find, find the answers from uh, Bill's book. Okay, excellent. And now let me quickly weigh in on Charlie B's uh, question. Uh, my response to uh, Charlie on this question is that you have to look at uh, the uh, new research that's coming out uh, in Southeast Asia about how we find uh, inspiration from pre-modern modes of dealing with China. And, and of course, this is where I have a difference with Bill's approach to say that everything is constructed uh, towards uh, a modern present. Uh, because if you look at the past, the pre-modern past, and you, you see echoes of this, uh, even if ASEAN diplomats won't openly admit it, uh, this idea of uh, accommodation, uh, avoiding the loss of face in a sharp manner, we can negotiate the saving of face together and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this is a whole thesis that deserves a separate seminar. But if you look for the academic literature looking at these informal aspects of Asian diplomatic styles, this is how ASEAN centrality can live with China even under Xi Jinping. And we'll get along, even with frictions, we'll find ways of gently pushing back and you know, progressing in a cooperative manner, even if there are sharp bits uh, here and there. Now, uh, before we wrap up, uh, and I, I've asked the organizers to allow the extension of the discussion by another five minutes or so, uh, Han Fook Kwang has this question, a very policy-oriented one. Um, now, Bill, first, uh, how do you understand China from the perspective of a policymaker? And I suppose Han Fook Kwang is thinking of whoever occupies the White House, all right, come January 2021. Uh, do you read China uh, from a policy angle by its actions primarily or by its nature? Okay, and how would you project a foreign policy prescription on this basis? Uh, well, I think you, you know, it's, it's helpful to try and understand a worldview, you know, kind of how a leadership kind of looks out of the world, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, its threats, its rightful place, um, what it deserves and all the rest of it. 
as well as understanding its you know short term needs, um, the various segments in society and what 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 their uh, demands are. Um, I mean, uh, I think we can assume that China under Xi Jinping is going to, you know, carry on its course. It feels, and as you mentioned, it has a moral imperative behind it. The territorial questions are questions of not just, um, you know, great power politics, but also emotional and, and moral questions. Um, and of course, you know, any party, any government leadership, you know, wants to make sure that it stays in power and that it doesn't get, you know, hung up on a lamppost. So, uh, you know, I, I, I imagine things will continue the same, <laughs> to be honest, and possibly on both sides, regardless of, you know, who's victorious in the US. Okay. Uh, would you like to say any last words uh, about your book before I go through the motions of uh, thanking you and uh, ending the discussion formally? Well, and this has been a very, thank you very much for the opportunity. This has been a very abbreviated discussion, although it's, you know, it's been good and we've explored lots of things. There's lots more in the book. And if you think I've been too sweeping and too generalizing, haven't acknowledged all my, you know, all my academic debts, you know, they're, they're in the book. So um, please have a read. Um, and I see this as a, you know, as a dialogue. I'm not claiming this is the last word. What I've tried to do is make uh, things accessible to a, a more general audience, uh, people who maybe aren't quite so familiar with, with some of these debates, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. There's even some jokes in there. Okay, all right. As I've complimented you, you're the master of micro-narratives too. All right. Uh, okay, Kong Xia would like to weigh in before we end. Yes, go well, ahead. The, the point to, to, to misunderstanding of China, well, at first, I feel there were like two trends, um, if I can generalize. First way is the segmentization uh, of Chinese image because of sort of like seeing for orange of being a communist party, then, you know, um, it, it, that is destined to be something different. So for I gave you example of the debt trap diplomacy where uh, uh, the famous political scientist Deborah Brodigam uh, from Johns Hopkins Science, she actually traced uh, the narrative where it came from. It came from India and then it spread to the White House. And then all of a sudden, you know, since 2018, then you know, the debt trap narrative began to become popular. Um, but but Deborah's, you know, research also found out, you know, throughout the years uh, for China's uh, aid programs or developing financing programs, they actually generate um, good or, or beneficial eco economic benefits to, to the local uh, employment rates, for example, to the local skill development, et cetera. But it seems like those voices are being much marginalized. So that's one thing I want to point out. Uh, and second is the overlook on the diversity of voices, which in, which actually tapped on the first uh, of the first point is um, the Chinese voices are not being heard. But it's not really the international society's fault. It's also you know Chinese government. They are being inward looking, and they are also restricting on the speech um, rights for the Chinese scholars and also perhaps journalists. And second is the political scientists who actually play with the numbers, who, uh, who actually uh, you know very specialized in development in politics and also in governance, their voices are not also not very um, highlighted either uh, when it comes when it comes to, I don't know if it comes to policy making, but at least in academic work, I feel it's it's like, you know, one side of story without mm. much mm. neutrality. So mm. I feel there's some space to improve on. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now it, remind, uh, it remains for me to uh, thank Bill Hayton for his very rich presentation for his time, Gong Shui also for your time and for your very uh, interesting wide-ranging thoughts about uh, China from the perspective of a Chinese scholar. Uh, and uh, most importantly, I also thank the participants for uh, you know, signing up for the session and for the questions uh, which stoke actually uh, a much wider coverage for the, the webinar than you know, we originally envisaged. Uh, and I have to put up some advertisement here uh, as requested by the events team. Uh, in the event that you'd like to follow up uh, uh, on, on Bill's slides, uh, drop the RSI's events team an email and the email can be found on the original e-flyer or advertising email sent out uh, earlier. And um, if uh, you'd like to follow up by buying uh, Bill Hayton's book, uh, you can contact the events team for an e-flyer, which in any case was circulated with the original advertisement for this webinar. Uh, 
in any case, uh, we will also flash a QR code. So for those of you who are very quick on your mobile phones, you can take a snapshot of the QR code as soon as this webinar formally closes, or you can just uh, take a screenshot of it, save it to your uh, Microsoft PowerPoint slide, and then you know you, at your leisure later, you can uh, scan it with your mobile phone and use uh, the usual uh, mobile payment methods to acquire the book. Uh, it is uh, being offered at a very special price just for this book launch at uh, Singapore uh, $18.45, okay, which is a huge, huge bargain uh, you know, if you want to buy this uh, soft cover edition at this point in time. Uh, do look out for future RSIS events, including a very interesting one coming up next week about uh, Europe uh, and the Indo-Pacific. Okay, or rather, the principal European powers' uh, reactions to the vision of the Indo-Pacific coming up early next week. Uh, with that, I think I should sign off here and thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.